this is one of the richest towns in South Africa, located 50 kilometers east of Cape Town. Counting the cents is the last thing residents of Stellenbosch have to do, but even they cash in on ShopRite's claim of being the most affordable retailer. Just down the road from the store lie the offices of the retail guru who turned ShopRite into Africa's largest grocer. His name is Dr. Whitey Basson. It's almost two years since he retired from ShopRite after 20 years of service. His departure is described as one of the best timed exits ever, as he pocketed about 1.8 billion rand when he sold his ShopRite shares shortly after. Nowadays, life is a lot less stressful than the days he used to manage hundreds and thousands of workers across 15 countries in Africa. Dr. Basan, once again, thank you very much for the time that you have given us uh, this afternoon. What do you keep yourself busy with lately since you stepped down from ShopRite as CEO? Phoebe, first of all, my name is Whitey, uh, not Dr. Basson, as you saw on the board. But thank you for calling me Dr. Basson. I feel very honored and very much more capable today. I basically try and help young guys in, the, in town. With, I help a lot of students with MBAs and lots of areas of that. For the rest, I look at investments with people that I can contribute to either in the form of sharing some thoughts or getting the money or investing in their companies if it's good enough. But I keep pretty busy and I run my family's affairs from here. And how is that? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I lose money like they, we all lose money in South Africa from time to time, but overall, I'm confident, I'm happy that the, the economy is never as bad as people say. When you say that the economy is not as bad as they say, I mean, obviously, the ones that are saying that it's bad are looking at the fact that growth has been stagnant for many years, are looking at the fact that unemployment has been rising for many years, and are looking at the fact that investments are not coming into this country as fast as they could be. So where are you seeing the glimmer of hope? South Africa has a history of high and low and negatives and positive growth for a long time. So growth is a function in time. It's not a, it's not a long term view unless the investments don't come into the country. So I think I would rather concentrate to say, I think a lot of investments can come into the country and will come into the country because the country has got unbelievable potential. If it can be spent properly, if it can be managed properly, if we have the, the right people at the head of whatever they may be to, to manage that investment. I see no reason why companies like SAA or ESCOM, etc. should fall out of the bus. I think it's purely a function of, and I don't want to insult anybody, but right from the top to the bottom, the good people are not given the chance to run it properly. I th I think he's your friend. He is there on your wall. You guys are in a gown graduating together. Dr. Johan Rupert has once been quoted as saying that the current president has never called him or spoken to him about the current state of the economy and as business what is needed. Has, has President Ramaphosa spoken with you? I've spoken to him a few times, but you can see on the board there's also the current Minister of Finance, because we got our honorary doctorates, it's the same day from Dr. Rupert, so we're both guilty in Dr. Dr. Rupert's regime out on, on, the, on the, the situation. I, I have no problems with the current president. I think he's trying his utmost and his damnest to, to, to run a good country. I have a problem that you will, ne you will never be able to run, to get your policies through to to the grassroots level where people can get jobs, which is one of our major problems, unless the whole system in the middle is properly defined. Now, I can tell you I have been involved in, in resuscitating two or three virtually all bankrupt companies in my life. The first job I did at Checkers was to tear up 60% of the paper that was distributed every day. It was nonsense, absolute nonsense. Now, whatever President Ramaphosa says about the top three, unless he gets the structures right, from issuing driver's licenses to getting workmen's compensation properly right, 
that the whole system is greased properly and running properly, it's not going to be in my lifetime or his lifetime when the people on the ground will benefit. At the heart of this is the fact that things are tough economically and also the fact that society or South Africa society is so unequal in terms of the haves and the haves nots. Yeah. Um, quite a number of policies being put on the table to address that, like for instance, the issue of land and expropriation without compensation. Um, what do you make of that? And especially as, 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 as a farmer, as someone who's got skin in the game, some of these policies to well, address. The, the advice I can give you is please, <laughs> if you want to make money and have a better life, don't take a farm, rather <laughs> take, take a share in ShopRite or some other place because it is not the most profitable investment in South Africa, so the whole farming thing is an emotional situation, but it's not economically very well thought out. If you look at the statistics on how well farmers perform, except that a lot of them have increases in their land value, it's not something which I would say to my, none of my children are going to become farmers. They will run farms with people, etc. But certainly I said make sure that you have your back door covered with some other income. So, 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 the, so that is the situation. The situation in terms of the vast disagreement with uh, a, a difference between income levels and, and asset levels is a function of, of South Africa, not alone. It's a function of many countries of the world. Ours stands out, but one of the main functions of capitalism, or, or, or capitalism which I believe in, is that you have to have equity and wealth somewhere to, to, to invest. Now, if I have enough money, I can give it away to 50 people or 100 people or 500 people and say, okay, I've now done that, which I do from time to time. I'm not saying it's wrong. But I can also use that same money to increase the size of my dam's wall by one and a half meters and give jobs to between 90 and 120 people as we discussed. Now those are the critical elements. In this building that you sit here, there's a lot of people with lots of money. But you think that their money goes into buying chewing gum for themselves, etc. They employ people. I, imp I use all my life in ShopRite, I used all my money that I got in salaries, that small salary that they paid me at the time. They should have paid me more, but that's between <laughs> you and me. I use that to invest into businesses where I could employ people. I think I personally employed something like 700 people out of my salary that I got from ShopRite or dividends, not out of farming operations or anything else. It's a double-edged sword as to what is a fine balance between distribution and not distribution. And that looks terrible on the, f on the sidewalk when a bloke stands there hasn't got a roof over his head. But shouldn't we all just contribute to get roofs over our heads? Should we should we not take the money that I told you just now, I don't want to mention which government which said this, how many billions of rands available for infrastructure development that's, that's hesitant to, envelop, to have it, and get all the people houses. I have personally tried for my own people that work on the farm, four or five people that have been with me for 10 years where I live, not even a farm but a, a small holding. I still haven't got the sites. I said, please just give me sites that I can build my people homes, give the transfer to them. I will give them at the, the houses to them, but that they can live there. But the system, somehow or another, the system just doesn't give land to say, have free old. They don't want the farm, they don't want anything. They are quite happy with their jobs. But they want their children to live near them. Their children live 500 miles away from them and they come and work here in my house as a domestic. Now I say, those things must be looked at and say, are there enough plots for the whitey persons and the other people in the world that maybe can afford to buy four plots and build a decent house for his people just to get it done? Now that's the problem with our, with our economy, as I said to you. Are the people good enough that service the generators at ESCOM or aren't they good enough? How can you have a, a blackout the one day and the next day say, oh, it's working? Mm. I mean, how do, you, how do you explain that? I can't explain to my children. Is it shortage of coal? Was the generator not switched on? What the hell happened? I think many of us are trying to figure that out, including the, the task teams and the numerous of experts and individuals. Tell us. Uh, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully they'll tell us as soon as that rescue plan for ESCOM really gets underway. But in your view, how you said that the balance is difficult, though. How how can one go about? Addressing it. There is no value and there's no logic in saying the two of us 
No, maybe you, maybe you have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that you have spent half no, or maybe half I want some of your money. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 there's the only way to solve the problems to get to create jobs. Now, we must take away the, the area that prevents it from getting to the actual job. Should it take a week to get a license? Should it take three years to get a license? And, and 120 people sit out there. You, and you, now, you must, now you talk about executives earning money, and I earned a lot of money, and I worked very hard for it, but my shareholders, so the pen, I paid a lot into the pensions of the civil servants, in the, into dividends from ShopRite, because they were big investors, so I don't feel too bad about it. They got more out of it than me, but I think what you, what you, what you need there is to say, how many of your senior executives do you, do you maintain in this country? My salary in, in dollar terms for dollar-based companies was peanuts. I had offers out of three major groups in the Western world for double, three times my salary. Read what the people earn. There's my uh, 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 personal assistant or CEO that's, CEO that's working with me now. I stopped him from going to Switzerland. He could have got double his salary that he earned in South Africa. He was offered a job over the mail, if you can call that, flown there. And I said, no, please, we need capable people for you to grow the cake so that more people can eat out of the cake. Not to divide the cake and we finish it and that's Friday afternoon. And that's, that's the mistake. Well, that's the difference I have with people that says, oh, we complain. Stop the complaints. Just let us say, those are the areas that we need to address and address them. Finish them off. But let's bring it back to ShopRite. Yes. Let, let, let's come to Africa right now. I mean, in your days, we used to speak about how, you know, champagne was being popped there in Angola and, and times were good, you know. Um, the rest of Africa has always been a, a very difficult place to navigate. It looks like it's a lot more difficult for ShopRite to do so now. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? Well, first let me tell you, of all the countries that, and, I, and, and I'm not on ShopRite's boards and I don't listen to all the to the theories and facts uh, uh, of about because I'm busy with my own life. So I said, I'm trying to make friends. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, the only countries that, that ShopRite really had problems with was Zambia, not Zambia, uh, Nigeria and Angola. Now Angola has gone through that stage a thousand times, but now put it in comparison, how good or how bad is Angola? I had a chat yesterday to Chris De Viso. I said, take Namibia and take Angola and draw yourself two lines and say, what is the difference between those two countries? How many people live in Angola? How many people live in Namibia? Angola pumps, I don't know, 100,000 barrels of oil a day still. I was going to check it on the internet, but uh, there's a couple of hundred thousand barrels, even at $60. They're the world's number two or number three diamond producer. They've got I don't know what percentage, but by far the, the, the mass of water in Africa. Namibia runs an economy where there's X number of shop rights and checkers branches and runs it very well. The country is very well managed. There's very little crime, etc. So they have ups and downs with the, with the small base that they have to make their money from. Why cannot Angola get to that same stage? So it's purely a situation of what went wrong in Angola that they short of foreign currency. But they're the, they're the third largest economy in Africa. Now why would, they, why would you think on the long term that they won't recover? I think this new president is doing a good job. He's trying his best. I in fact said to them, I'll take them side bets, he'll get it sorted out shortly. That money will be more freely available. I was there six weeks ago with my son to just go and have a look at the country. And I was impressed. There weren't poor people. There were Mont Blanc pens in, in the shopping centers and fancy watches, and people were buying them. So yes, there's a problem in terms of foreign currency that you get at. And then there's obviously this, when they call it hyperinflation, 
There's a format of accountancy which I'm glad that I qualified as a chartered accountant before all these IFRAs and FIVES, etc. came because it makes no sense to me to revalue something and then you have to write it down, one through the P&L and the other one not, and that's all technical. So there's a lot of technical things which is, which is all, what's his name? But the, the company will grow. It is so you're not too worried about the situation I'm in Angola worried. now? Nigeria, I'm not sure because I don't know the situation that well in Nigeria. But Nigeria is either, depends which, who's the prime minister, who's the president of South Africa, is either the biggest or the second largest economy in Africa. In Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe needs time, but I think Zimbabwe is probably the, 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 the land or the, what's his name, the, the country with the highest upside potential of all the countries close to us, by Based far. Based on? Hmm? Based on? Based on the fact that it was always there. It was, it was the, n the number one agricultural country in the world. The breadbasket, essentially. Some 35 years ago. So <laughs> what has changed? The land is the same. It was badly managed. It was badly managed by a, a president who had a different agenda. So you think the, um, there's a possibility that this new president, even though he still comes from the same party, Zanu PF, that there's a possibility that if President um, Emerson Nangaga does the things, he can, you know, return Zimbabwe to his former glory? Well, I, I don't, don't know him. I've never met him. I don't know how smart he is. I'll have to play a game of cards against him to see if he's <laughs> what his style is. But if he doesn't, there's something wrong with him. Mm. Because he's been dealt a hand, which is bad at this stage. But, I mean, he will, he has got a country that's been there now. There's nothing in the world that says you can't change it. Let's bring it to South Africa now. You spoke yeah. a bit about, you know, buying a shop right share. Have you seen the share price lately? No, I think the share prices were too high. So, first of all, you saw that correction. You saw PEs at 23s and 25s, which then ex expects you to have a a growth of 15% plus, uh, which is literally impossible for the medium to short term. So that was the correction. But if you ask me where they're standing at the moment, then I can say to you that there's, in ShopRite, from what I hear, and I'm, I don't have the facts, they're doing very well in South Africa. They're not unhappy with their sales growth. They're growing market share, etc., etc. When I walk down the street and I see how many people are shopping and and the money that they pay for shoes, I'm sure there's a lot of um, money still around, maybe in a vault or somewhere, <laughs> but there's enough money <laughs> Under <around>. the mattress. <laughs> the, the difference in retailing will be that uh, I think it will be stronger with, uh, with internet sales. You've been known as keeping a very close watch on their numbers and their recovery and how yeah. it comes across in the whole um, market. Are you still doing that? And what are those numbers saying in terms no, of market no, I, share? I, 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 do not, I do not follow the day-to-day -day, uh, businesses of any retailer at the moment. I tried, I said I want to take off for two years or so just to get sane for a change. Uh, but I think pick and pay went through, in my days, went through the same uh, problems as what ShopRite had. You, you, you have a complete change of management and you have the the Steinhoff saga on the sideline, and have lots of people leaving, lots of people retiring. One wants to work with Whitey, the other one doesn't want to work with Whitey, wants to work with Peter, the chairman is all over the show. So that is a time cycle in a, in a business. But what I can tell you is that I know the stores of ShopRite, I know the people that work, the people that work on the floor. They're talented and good people. They, I never employed anybody, made a point of it, that was not capable of doing a good job. So those things will come right. So if the rest of the world dumps, then okay, we will go down that curve a bit. But long term, it's an inherently very good company. I know I started it. Steinhoff, um, yeah. as you raised it, what were your thoughts December 2017 when, you know, like the rest of South Africa, in fact, the rest of the world, the drum, the, that bombshell dropped of that alleged accounting fraud then that has since been proven? I don't know if it's been proven, but I mean... The PwC so forensic report well, has, has I haven't got a copy yet, so... <laughs> Mr. U.S. hasn't got a copy, I haven't got a copy, so I just I hear I wonder if he wants one, but nonetheless, so what was I'd your view? I'd love to read it, because I once used to work for PwC. I, I'm really not sure if that c 
if that case will ever come before court in its entirety and what happened there. Nobody has shown me anything that says Eustace stole money. He was a difficult, per he was a diff diff difficult person, I think. We didn't get on well, or I didn't like him very much when I, when I was nearly forced into a, into a merger. Uh, but that's personalities. I only when I looked at his business afterwards, because when Chris had discussed the deal, I thought, no, this is not something that I'd like to be associated with. So what was it that made you uncomfortable? It was just badly run shops. There were no retailers. It's like modern boards, 55 accountants. We must have one white, one black, one female, one male, one Indian, one whatever it is. But they don't have to have experience on retail. It's just a, the, the structure is wrong for retail companies. So I walk into a store and I can see the bananas are rotten or there's not sugar on the shelf or this milli meal packet is not available. That's a number one seller, etc. So I was very uncomfortable when I looked at the shoe, shoe business which they bought. I don't like shoe businesses because I can't remember one from my youth. That's still... No, no, I'm talking Techie Town, yeah. I'm talking all oh, pep, uh, pep stores had a lot of them. I used to work for pep stores. I used to run that company in 74. Because uh, when the Steinhoff um, deal first came on the table, the Steinhoff ShopRite merger first came on the table, then it didn't go ahead the first time around and there was views in the market that it was because you were against it. Was that the that reason it didn't well go obviously ahead? Obviously that was against it, yeah. And then the second time when you it... You think I would have in favour of it, I could find no financial figures that despite all the reports, I could find no financial figures and I had two people working on it for me that could prove to me that it's a good investment. So I never invested in them. The return on equity at that stage was worked out for me by the people that do my shares. It was like something five point something, and the cost of, of, of debt was something like eight point something. Now, if you can't deduct eight from five, you should retire like I did. I, I just said the sums don't work, it's the wrong way around. So Is that the reason why then, when the deal went through the second time around, I mean, the timing of your exit and the selling of your ShopRite shares, I'm just wondering if there was a connection to say that with that deal going ahead, you're out. No, the deal wasn't, the original deal was that it would have been like the Pepco deal. Mm -hmm. We would have sold all our shares to Steinhoff and taken Steinhoff shares with whatever preference. I said, over my dead body, I've got lots of people. I built the company, I've got seven stores to two and a half thousand and I'm dead against it and I tried to stop the deal whichever means I had in my possession. The second deal that Christopher put to me was he says that you always said you want to have it listed and now I will only sell my shares together with the PIC to Steinhoff but your guys can stay in the listed ShopRite vehicle. So you will have a different controlling shareholder, but the company would stay the same. Now, I can't fight with anybody, and he's a good friend of mine, if he says, I want to sell my shares. I mean, he can sell his shares to whoever he wishes to. And I said, but you know, I know you very well, and I, I actually wanted to retire 24 months before that because I was tired of the things that I've just told you about, red tape and nonsense to get something done. I said, Christo, I cannot sit at a board where I feel uncomfortable with, you must remember at that stage, Steinhoff would have had Joester as their CEO, which effectively would have been the guy who calls the shots down to ShopRite because he was the major shareholder. Now, Christo never called shots down to, sh to ShopRite for various reasons. Uh, one of the reasons we were very good friends, he's a brilliant guy corporately wise, but he knows nothing about retailing. And, and I shouldn't say that on television, but <laughs> he's a nice guy. But he, no, okay, so what? He, you know, he, he's a very nice, and he recognized his strengths and his weaknesses. So there was no interference on the way that the company was run. Management ran the company in a very responsible way. I had very good standards that, that had to be maintained, and he was happy with them when he looked at the numbers. That, came up nicely to him. You say that you left retail to get a bit of a break and get your sanity again, um, but if there was a, a call from the market that you make a comeback to retail formally, uh, perhaps in the form of the chairperson of ShopRite, is this something that you would consider? You know, I had, I think I had the first call like one day after the bubble burst from out of New York from very good uh, investors or very big investors and I said, now, there's just nothing in it for me. 
except to destroy me because it's like going in back into the ring for a boxer for the second time. In ShopRite, I said the same when people asked me, a lot of the, the, lot of the investors said to me, would you not want to join, rejoin the board? Or what's his name? I said, no, I don't want to do that at this stage. I don't want to even have a conflict of interest with Krista and myself. And quite frankly, I don't think that I would fit into into resurrecting something which which probably needs different strengths or stif different capabilities. So, so right now, I'm much more content that I work three days a week. I don't play golf enough. I, in fact, I haven't played for about six weeks. But I, I feel much more comfortable here. If a situation ever arises that the people that I dearly love, and remember that I started with 1,500 people, there are now 130,000 people. And they still come and visit me, and they still phone me, etc. If there's a possibility that those people will be harmed, or that the company would uh, falter, then I regard it as my duty that I will stand with the people.